Um, our next speaker is Ken Dodds. Ken is a statistician at Invermay and um, has been uh, heavily involved in all of the OVITA work um, and uh, won the McMeekin Award for the New Zealand Society of Animal Production for some of this work recently. And Ken is going to talk about the OVITA um, genomic predictions. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Neville. Um, so just first up, I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the team that have worked on sort of the analysis side of, of this project. Um, so Benoit and Michael, who are both now at the University of Otago, and um, Shirley and John, all very heavily involved. Um, so to undertake genomic selection, there's a few things we need. The first is a good set of markers. So we need um, lots and lots of um, genotypes, um, and it's normally SNPs that we want to use, so tens of thousands of those. Uh, we need some animals that have been measured, um, both phenotyped and genotyped, that are representative of industry to be our training set of animals. And then we need to put it together into some sort of predictor. And one of the issues about this predictor is that we often have more, um, more things to predict with, so more markers than we have animals. So we need some robust way of doing that. Um, our genotyping platforms, so within OVITA prog program, um, the the bead chip was, um, first became available in early 2009, so it assays um, about 54,000 SNPs. After some QC process, we're down to about 47,000 autosomal SNPs. Um, <clears throat> these have um, very good uh, properties, so good um, call rates, less than 0.1% missing, and um, low, low genotyping errors. And um, then in 2012, the first of the low density chips was developed, um, and there's been a few versions of those, so between five and 6,000 um, SNPs on those. Um, at the end of July, um, within the Avita program, there'd been about 13,500 animals genotyped with um, the 50K chip. Um, most of these animals are um, Romneys with some Coopworths, Pirandales and a few Texels and, and other breeds. So this is roughly representative of the New Zealand um, sort of dual purpose uh, breeding animals. Uh, these are mostly sires, um, so they've got um, good breeding values. Um, within this analysis, we split the breeds into these different groups and, and we called um, Animals that had at least 75% of that breed, we, we treated them as if they were um, a pure breed or, or we labelled them by that uh, breed name, so Romney, Coopworth, Pirandale, Texel. Also set aside some composite groups, so if it had at least or more than 30% Romney, Coopworth, Pirandale, we've called it a composite within this um, project. But we've also taken out a subset of that that's um, got some more... Um, so it's a greater percentage of Romney Coop with Perindale and less than 25% Texel. So the analysis, we first take uh, estimating breeding values from, from a cell analysis with, um, so that analysis had 4.4 million animals from 322 flocks. Um, for the genotyped animals, we take the breeding values, remove the parent contribution, um, then, then those breeding values are then deregressed, so divide by the reliability, and that's giving us um, our Y value to work with, our phenotype, if you like. So the deregression puts the spread back to what it, um, a phenotype value would be. Uh, we don't use all the values, so we've got a cutoff of 0.8 um, times the heritability, so roughly as if the animal had been measured for the trait. Um, so that's, that gives us some... Um, phenotypes to work with, and then it goes into essentially the same sort of model as we do um, for breeding values, but it's called a, a GBLUP model because it uses genomic information. And it, um, we use that to get what we call molecular breeding values. So this model, um, we fit principal components to take out the main breed structure. Uh, the, the model is weighted because we've got different reliabilities on the phenotypes. Um, we use the fixed heritability that's in SIL. And instead of, the, instead of the pedigree relationships, relationships, we use the genomic relationships. So we call that a, a G matrix instead of um, what's normally called an A. Um, and one specific point about that is that it, um, it's calculated using breed-specific allele frequencies. Um, <clears throat> we divide our um, animals into to training and validation sets so we can see how well this is working. And the way we do it is we 
we use the older animals for training and the younger ones for validation because that sort of mimics how this is going to be applied in practice uh, where you're doing the selection in the younger animals. Um, so Romney Cook with Piandale and that Comp 1 group were all allowed to be in training. Um, the youngest of those groups were in, in validation. The, the remainder, remainder of the composites could also go into that um, composite validation group. And then we've got a, another group of Texels. It's not really a validation group, it's just a group to see if these predictions can work across breed. Um, so this is the numbers um, for a few of the traits. So obviously um, weaning weights measure on almost everything, so we've got some quite good information on that, whereas uh, traits like NLB, it takes a while to build up that information. So there's, there's fewer animals in training. Um, there was a, our validation sets, um, we had a cutoff of about 200 animals, so they're, they're reasonably constant except for the composite group that can have those extra animals. <clears throat> um, calculated two measures of accuracy. So the first one is a realised accuracy, and that's looking in those validation sets, take the correlation of that Y value, that, which is that deregressed um, breeding value, um, correlate that with our prediction, the molecular breeding value, and then because Y is not the true breeding value, we divide by um, R, where R squared is the effect of heritability or the, or the mean reliability of those Y values. We also get a, um, a reliability or an accuracy measurement out of um, the GBLUP model, and so we can use that. We get that gives values for each individual animal, and so um, we've taken the mean of those in the validation set to give what I've called a model-based accuracy. Right. So this is quite a busy slide, but. Um, goes through the results. So we've got uh, 20 traits um, that, so we actually predict on a few more traits, but these 20 traits are the ones that end up in SIL indexes. Um, so I've grouped them into growth, meat, wool, reproduction, survival, um, facial eczema, DAGs, and the parasite resistant traits. Um, so we've got a um, number of animals in the training set, number of Romneys in the training set, um, but there are the other breeds as well. Um, so it just gives you an idea of um, how that changes across traits. If we look at the realised accuracies and the model-based accuracies, the first thing to notice is that they're quite different uh, for this set of traits out here. So the, the realised accuracies are lower than the model-based ones. And um, what's likely happening here is these are the traits that are uh, measured early in life or are well correlated with um, early measurements. And so this is likely to be a selection effect that the animals that actually get genotyped have already been pre-selected based on some of their, um, their own phenotype values or even maybe um, some progeny values. Um, so that, if you think about a correlation graph, that sort of sh shortens up one end and makes your correlation lower. Um, so apart from that, these um, lines sort of track reasonably well. There's, there's slightly higher values here for the um, parasite traits. They have better realised heritabilities than the model would predict. Um, so what we do in the end is, is to give one sort of overall measurement. We've used this what called combined measurement, which is just the average of these two values. Um, so that's our sort of standard um, reporting figure for the traits. Um, and overall, you, the, um, all the traits, this value sort of varies between, mostly between 0.4 and 0.5, a few a bit higher. Um, the meat yield traits are a little bit lower. Um, so that's sort of overall for, Rom, for Romneys. And now to get a feel for how the other breeds um, compare with that, I've just got them all um, stuck together in one slide. So on this axis, that was that combined value for Romneys from the previous slide. And so I've stuck a, a blue line up here to say that's the identity line. So if you're above that line, then you're, then you're doing better than, you were, than the Romneys were doing for that trait, and below you're doing worse. Um, so the Coopworths in green here um, are occasionally better and, and sometimes worse, but sort of on average about the same as the Romneys. Um, 
the Pirandales and the composites both fall mostly below the line, um, so they're sort of 0.1 or so below what the Romney accuracies are. And then the Texels fall quite low, so this is saying we're not very good at predicting a totally different breed um, from, from that Romney, Kirkworth and Pirandale training set. <coughs> Having said that, there's about 1% Texel genetics in, in that training set just because of the crossbreeds that are still in there. Um, so for commercial application, we use that um, breed-adjusted genomic relationship for our predictions. Um, the accuracies, when, when we give sort of tables of these, are the mean of the realised and model-based accuracies by breed group. Um, to report a, a, a breed trait combination, we require the realised accuracy to be significantly greater than zero. Um, all this is now done within SIL, so um, the molecular breeding values are calculated, that they're scaled to make their spread what we would expect them to be based on their accuracies. So that adjusts for um, what's, what's mostly seen to be over predictions. Um, we use individual accuracies, so these are the model based accuracies, are the ones that actually um, get attached to those breeding values. Um, there's this blending, so what blending is, it combines the genomics, so the molecular breeding values, with our most recent um, SIL run for these animals, so their most recent um, estimated breeding values from SIL, and they're put together to give a combined estimate of their genetic worth. And then for the young animals, um, to make it uh, more cost effective, we use the 5K chip, which is cheaper um, to run, uh, but the genotypes from that are taken and, and using um, sort of training sets of, of animals that have had uh, the 50K genotypes, these are imputed up so they look like the um, 50K genotypes. Uh, so in conclusion, um, we've got a mixed breed training set of, of those closely re related breeds, the Romney-based breeds. <coughs> um, genomic selection is, is available for Romney, Coopworth, Perendale and their composites in New Zealand. And the breeding values um, based on genomics are delivered through SIL. And I'd just like to acknowledge at the end there's lots of other people being involved with this project, um, so um, thank you to all those, those people. Thank you, Ken. We've got time for one question, just a, a point of clarification, um, if anybody has one. Everybody's saving them for the end. Excellent. Thank you, Ken.